The decision has finally been made. NASA just confirmed Butch and Sonny will not return on Starliner, but instead SpaceX's Crew Dragon. This is a huge decision that has colossal consequences on the future of Boeing Starliner, so we're going to dive through the last 80 days of testing and decision making and what's next for these two astronauts, Boeing and the Starliner program. With NASA making one of the biggest decisions in the agency's history, how do we end up here? I feel really comfortable about return now with that happening. I feel confident that if we had to, if there was a problem with the International Space Station, we can get in our spacecraft and we can undock, talk to our team, and figure out the best way to come home. The plan has played out really well. In addition, it's given us additional confidence to undock and, and return. And The Boeing team is... Um, 100% behind their vehicle. They have confidence in their vehicle. That's what we would like from them, that they have worked on it so hard and believe in it so strongly that they would be a tremendous uh, supporter for a return on their vehicle. NASA has decided that Butch and Sonny will return with Crew-9 next February. Okay, that's a lot. Let's break that down and return to June 5th, 2024. At 14.52 and 15 seconds exactly UTC, or 10.52 local time, ULA's Atlas V with Starliner Calypso on top ascended from Space Launch Complex 41 at the Cape Canaveral Space Force Station in Florida, returning human spaceflight capabilities to this side of the peninsula for the first time since the Saturn program. Initially, the mission appeared to be progressing nominally, with Starliner separating from the Centaur 3 upper stage and conducting its orbital insertion burn to put it on course for a rendezvous with the International Space Station. Butch and Sonny even conducted a manual flying demonstration where they were able to manually point Starliner using the hand controller whilst travelling through space. However, as we would learn the following day, this mission was far from problem free. As it approached the International Space Station, Starliner Calypso began to suffer issues with five of its Reaction Control System, or RCS, thrusters. These are the smaller thrusters which spacecraft use in order to rotate and translate in the vacuum of space, and they are critical pieces of hardware when rendezvousing, let alone docking, with the space station. These thrusters were going offline because of the way the Starliner software was written by Boeing. In the event that one of the thrusters' parameters is out of bounds with a slower than expected ramp up to full power or lower thrust than expected as examples, the software automatically completely disables it. Because of the five thrusters going offline at various points throughout the process, the docking itself was delayed for over an hour as the ISS controllers wanted to keep Starliner outside of their 200 meter so-called keep out sphere, whilst its thrusters were unreliable. In the briefing immediately following the docking, NASA and Boeing said that they were able to return four out of the five thrusters to operation by firing each thruster individually to ensure they were working as expected. At, at White Sands, we, we were excited and that was really a turning point in that we were able to replicate uh, the loss of thrust. We simulated the, the uphill profile, in other words, how the thrusters fired from the launch sequence and on orbit all the way to docking. We did two of those uphill sequences and then we did a number of downhills. And so we were encouraged when we saw that we could actually see thrust degradation in those downhill runs. Once we took the thruster apart and we looked at the, the valve on the oxide, oxidizer side, we saw this swelling on the Teflon seat, which uh, when we talked to the, the vendor, Aerojet Rocketdyne, they had never seen this before in this particular thruster. And so initially we were somewhat excited by replicating the damage but or the degradation in the thrust. But then when we looked a little more closely, we saw this swelling on the Teflon. And then that gave us a whole new uh, idea of the physics involved in the failure mode. The thrusters shutting themselves down weren't the only issues with Starliner's propulsion system, however. The helium atoms inside of the vehicle decided they wanted to escape, and two leaks were detected prior to docking, which were in addition to an original helium leak detected before launch. To allow this docking to go ahead, Boeing had to use extra helium to repressurize the propulsion system, which they did. And then, to make the headlines even worse, Starliner developed a fourth helium leak 
after docking to the ISS. However, docking to the ISS was actually quite beneficial for the evaluation of these leaks because when docked, Boeing is able to close the propulsion system manifolds, which in turn stops the helium from leaking. Boeing's vice president and commercial crew program manager, Mark Nappy, said at the time that these issues were, quote, pretty small, and he didn't see these as, quote, significant at all. Those are pretty small, really, issues to go deal with, and we'll figure them out for the next mission. Uh, so I, I don't see these as significant at all. So that was the playing field for the start of Butch and Sunny's stay aboard the ISS. Starliner had some issues, but the Boeing VP in charge of the program said that these issues weren't significant, so it was considered to be plain sailing, nominal operations from here. Boeing still had 70 hours of helium left on board Starliner, and they only needed seven hours of those to undock, deorbit, and return the crew back home. Or at least it was until June 10th when NASA quietly included a line in their latest update to the crew flight test blog. Quote, teams currently are assessing what impacts, if any, five small leaks in the service module helium manifolds would have on the remainder of the mission. That's right, they had announced a fifth leak on the service module, which actually started during the previous briefing, hence why NASA hadn't mentioned it until this point. This was later confirmed to be much smaller than the prior four, but still, it's one more leak than they had before. Then came the raft of delays that have become synonymous with the crew flight test mission. First on June 14th, NASA announced a delay to June 18th. Then on the 18th, it was extended to the 25th, then to early July without a firm date, then perhaps to the end of July, and then on July 25th, they said they still hadn't set a date. At this point, either they were coming home tomorrow, or the launch of SpaceX's Crew-9 rotation flight was being delayed. And it was the latter. Originally slated for August 18th, Crew-9 was pushed to a not earlier than date of September 24th, giving NASA and Boeing an extra month and a half of time to figure out what on earth they were going to do to resolve the Starliner issues. With one final delay, the deadline shifted from mid-August to late August, and well, that day is today. NASA astronauts Butch Wilmore and Sonny Williams, commander and pilot of the Starliner crew flight test respectively, have now been in space for 80 days, exactly 10 times longer than the original scheduled mission duration. Unlike some of the headlines you may have read whilst browsing through the internet over the last few weeks, Butch and Sonny are not stranded aboard the ISS. That might sound strange given the circumstances, but they're not stuck. They're not running out of food, they're not running out of water or oxygen, and they also have a way to come home, even if it's not going to be the same ride they took on the way up. The station is constantly supplied by multiple different cargo vehicles and has reserves to run for months and months, even if the resupply ships stop coming. If anything, they are both probably happy to stay in space for longer, helping the other crews on station to get through all of the tasks and helping carry out research inside the orbiting laboratory. Of course, it is probably taxing on the sentimental side of things, taking longer to come back home and be with their loved ones and missing events back on the ground. But astronauts are trained for this. They are aware of these challenges. They know these things happen and they're ready for it. I mean, think about it, they're astronauts. It's not an easy job, so whoever is called upon to serve in one of the riskiest jobs on the planet and off the planet is for sure ready for this type of thing. We all went into this knowing that this is a flight test and with that it is, it, it does come with some risk and again Butch and Sonny were aware of that uh, when they accepted this mission and they understand that throughout. A mission extension by itself is not inherently bad. This mission was always designed to be a minimum of eight days long, meaning that there was always room for it to be extended. There are actually many examples of other crew missions being extended for multiple reasons, and as a matter of fact, SpaceX's Demo 2 mission with Bob Benkin and Doug Hurley, their equivalent of the Starliner crew flight test, was also extended. Although that mission extension came months before the launch took place and it was in order for the crew to be part of the station's Expedition 63 crew. A recent example more similar to Starliner's story is the case of the crew of Soyuz MS-22. After a couple of months docked to the station, this spacecraft suffered a coolant leak on its service module that rendered it unsafe for a nominal return to Earth. Its crew had to remain inside the ISS for an entire year instead of the usual six-month stay, and they also came back on Soyuz MS-23, a different spacecraft than the one they had used on the way up. So why, and more importantly how, did NASA reach this conclusion? It's an enormous decision to make, sending Butch and Sunny home on the competitor's spacecraft, so it is a big deal to pick Dragon over Starliner. 
The easiest way to explain it is that NASA can't trust Starliner's propulsion system. The multiple helium leaks detected in the thruster shutdowns whilst transiting to and docked at the International Space Station just pose too great a risk for a crewed undocking and deorbit. And let's be clear here, spaceflight is inherently risky, that's just part of the game, but if there is any doubt anywhere within the agency, it's much better to err on the side of caution even with the implications it could have. It is a trying to turn around the culture that first led to the loss of Challenger and then led to the loss of Columbia, where obvious mistakes were not being brought forth. In the event that too many thrusters went offline during Starliner's undocking and or the deorbit burn, that could leave Starliner stuck in orbit, unable to return back to Earth. Or perhaps the helium system would leak so much, Starliner just runs out of it. Those are the types of scenarios that would have been playing through the minds at NASA and Boeing, and they needed to make the decision on how to make sure that doesn't ever happen. NASA has openly acknowledged before during media briefings that there was disagreement within the agency as to whether Starliner was safe enough for a crewed return or not. And at the end of the day, the decision will keep rising up the ranks until it ends up on the desk of NASA Administrator Bill Nelson. It is far far better for Butch and Sonny to return on Dragon Freedom and Starliner Calypso to return to Earth uncrewed without issue than it is to risk a loss of crew. An interesting note also is that in the latest conference when Administrator Nelson announced that Butch and Sonny would be returning on Crew 9, there were no Boeing representatives. Every single panelist was from NASA. Bill Nelson did say he had just spoken to Boeing CEO Kelly Ortberg, but alas, Nobody from Boeing was there to answer our questions. The reason Boeing's not here is, is, is it was a NASA decision today, crewed, uncrewed. That was the focus of this review. And so we thought it was reasonable to have just NASA on this panel. I will note, however, that Boeing Space on X has posted a statement saying, quote, we continue to focus first and foremost on the safety of the crew and spacecraft. We are executing the mission as determined by NASA and we are preparing the spacecraft for a safe and successful uncrewed return. It should also be pointed out that 2024 is a presidential election year in the United States, so naturally it was asked in the conference if politics took any part in this decision. I have seen some speculation in the press that uh, because we are in an election season that decisions may have been made with regard to uh, this announced today with regard to an election. Absolutely has nothing to do with it. And as long as I'm around here, it's not going to. With that said, the next item on the agenda for Starliner is to attempt a return back to Earth. And because NASA has decided it isn't safe enough for Butch and Sunny to be on board, Boeing will be conducting an autonomous, uncrewed undocking, deorbit burn and landing in the southwest United States. During the briefing, NASA did not specify a date of when that undocking will take place. However, it has to take place before the Crew-9 mission launches, if NASA wishes to have a crew handover on board the station. There are only two docking adapters attached to the ISS capable of handling Dragon and Starliner. And well, three spacecraft just won't fit into two docking ports. Earlier you mentioned that there would be a simplified undocking procedure. Can you kind of explain what that means of what this undocking would be like compared to, say, with crew, uh, and what the contingency would be if there is an issue at some point with that undocking and burn away from the station. And so normally we would back away from the space station, um, essentially go uh, out in front and then above the space station, and then eventually end up below the space station and then on a trajectory that, that goes beneath it and out in front of the space station. That was our normal. Uh, what we'll do is we'll go through a a step sequence that puts us on, I would say, what's called a, a pause grade trajectory. And so we'll end up going essentially phasing out behind the space station to a safe distance, and then we'll get away from the space station and execute the deorbit burn. So uh, we've tested this step sequence. It is already in the software. It's, it's one of the breakout sequences that are already in the software. And so what we'll do is just go command that sequence early uh, and use that to get away more quickly. 
Because Starliner will be undocking prior to the arrival of Crew-9, their new ride home, they need a safe haven, which isn't Starliner Calypso or Dragon Freedom, because there will be a period of time where neither of them are docked to the station. And that's why the Dragon serving the Crew-8 mission, Crew Dragon Endeavour, will become the safe haven for six ISS crew members, the original four from Crew-8, plus Butch and Sunny. In the very unlikely event that the ISS becomes uninhabitable for any reason, or for example controllers on the ground believe there is a risk of being struck by space debris, the crew on board need somewhere to evacuate to, somewhere to shelter in order to stay safe. That is normally always their designated return vehicle. If astronauts A and B are from a Soyuz and astronauts C and D are from a Dragon, then A and B would use Soyuz as their safe haven and C and D would use Dragon as their safe haven. But of course, when your return vehicle hasn't actually arrived yet, you need a different vehicle to be your safe haven. Therefore, Crew 8's Dragon Endeavour will be outfitted for Butch and Sunny to return on the cargo pallet at the aft of the capsule, so it can act as this safe haven for them. I will reiterate, however, that this is not the plan. It is just a contingency in case something happens before Crew 9 arrives. And speaking of Crew 9, they've still got to launch, but who are they is an interesting question. Because Butch and Sunny have been assigned to two of the four seats on the downward leg of the mission, NASA has to leave two seats empty on the upward leg. NASA still would not confirm who would be flying and who wouldn't be flying on Crew-9. However, we highly suspect, based on rumours and our own estimations, that NASA's Nick Haig and Stephanie Wilson, originally the pilot and a mission specialist of Crew-9 respectively, will be making way for Butch and Sunny. Crew-9 mission will now configure Dragon for two crew members and will provide seats for Butch and Sunny to return. We're also working to finalize those crew assignments and update the training plan. This is to allow the seat barter agreement between NASA and Roscosmos to continue. So NASA's Zena Cardman will continue in her role as commander of Crew-9, whereas Roscosmos' Alexander Gurbanov will essentially get an upgrade to pilot of Crew-9, the first time a Russian has piloted an American spacecraft. Once Crew-9 arrives at the ISS, Butch and Sunny will become a part of that crew and Expedition 72, taking on the jobs of Hagen Wilson, conducting scientific research and living the astronaut life until next February. That's the scheduled return month for Crew-9, when Dragon Freedom will undock, deorbit and splash down in the Pacific Ocean, concluding an approximately nine-month mission for Butch Wilmore and Sunny Williams. As I said before though, astronauts are aware of these challenges before they ever step foot in a spacecraft. That duration of a mission is not inherently a big deal. NASA has conducted longer missions multiple times before, and the overall continuous spaceflight duration record is held by Valery Polyakov at 437.7 days long. That's over 14 months. Assuming Starliner Calypso is able to conduct a full re-entry and landing successfully, Boeing and NASA will be conducting significant analysis of what they can, considering that they only get the capsule back. These thruster and helium issues have been on the service module, which is separated prior to re-entry and will burn up in the atmosphere. There is no way to return this hardware to the ground. Multiple times in multiple previous briefings, NASA officials have said that Starliner could still be certified to conduct operational missions without returning a crew home during its flight test. Some may see that as an unexpected outlook, but if NASA is confident in the vehicle for future operations, then it's their call where they want to put their crew. Starliner 1, the first operational mission of Starliner, is currently scheduled for the autumn of 2025, but it is double booked with SpaceX's Crew-11 in the event that more time is needed. There's also a chance that there will be calls from political figures, or perhaps even Boeing themselves for reviews into, or perhaps even a cancellation of the Starliner program. The commercial crew contract awarded by NASA to SpaceX and Boeing is a fixed price contract. That means you get that amount of money and nothing else. This is different to the previous standard of cost plus contracts, where NASA would fit the bill no matter what. To date, Boeing has spent its awarded money, so now it's footing the bill itself for future Starliner development. Either way, this situation will still not be a good look for Boeing. The company has seen multiple problems with its commercial airplanes division for years, including the groundings of the 737 MAX following the two 737-8 MAX crashes in 2018 and 2019, then the 737-9 MAX being grounded again due to a door plug popping out during an Alaska Airlines flight at the start of this year, the endless delays with its 777X program, and now the spacecraft side of the business has had the Starliner CFT mission to contend with. 
the future of this program is going to be interesting, no matter the outcome. We're here every Friday with This Week in Spaceflight, our weekly space news show, and if it's not in your routine to watch it yet, then it totally should be. It's basically like this video, except squeeze it down to three minutes, do lots of them in a row, and throw in some launches, throw in Alicia as well, and yeah, you need to watch it. We have been and will continue to be keeping up with the Starliner program over there. For now, I've been Ryan Caton for NSF. Thanks for watching and goodbye.